very good morning to you. Welcome to the Morning Brief right here on Channels Television. I'm Jeffrey Uzama, and as always, I'm with my people, as I love to call them. To the left, Kayalu Kikulu. To the left again, closer to me, Bukola Kuka. Not a leftist, though. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do that. Okay. Yeah. So as opposed to people, what else would you have called us? My guys. <laughs> what would you rather have it be? Well, he said that. My, my people, as I called them, so I was thinking, what else could we have been? Do you remember that governor? My people, my people. <laughs> my governor, my governor, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've well, seen a lot in this country. Really. Oh, yes, we have. And, you know, we're sure to see more, but more of positives. Good morning and welcome. It's the morning after the storm. Another one. But we're grateful still. It's the morning brief on Channels Television. I'm Bukola Koka. <sighs> looks like the rains are angry. Not even the rain is angry because it looks like it's a multitude <laughs> of rain just hitting Lagos this morning. I hope that your structure has survived the rain that we've seen in the past few hours here in Lagos. But welcome to the nation's commercial capital. I'm Kaido Kikulu. I had to drive. So I realize that when it rains quite early in the morning, that's when I wake up earlier than I should wake up. Oh, good. Uh, because I have to drive a little, you know, it's calmer. Carefully. Not yeah. the way I drive sometimes. I don't want to say how I drive <laughs> when I want to drive to my drive. Because the road is you know, quite clear that early morning, so you can you can run as fast as you want, but of course you have to be careful mm -hmm. uh, and be cautious. My wife will say, drive according to the speed you can control. So for third mainland bridge, you can go beyond 80 kilometers. For Lagos Ibado, I'm not sure of the kilometers, but just drive um, as much as you can control. Can control. Recommended like speed. Uh, my producer said recommended speed. Oh yeah, there's always the speed limits. Mm -hmm. inside the road. You know, we, in, you know we, we use intuition a lot in this country to do things. Like, you know, if abroad they want to cook food, they will say, uh, this kilogram of that, this kilogram of that, and all of that. Jeffrey, I only just keep putting morning. the salt until the spirit says, stop. You're going okay. there And we morning. are always right, kind of. So perhaps that's, the, that's what we do when we drive. But producers say recommended speed. Absolutely. <laughs> bad or expressway. Don't go the way of Jeffrey this morning. Uh, you know, oh. we're, we're all very different in mm. our eccentricities and uh, in our proclivities, if, my, if I may say. <laughs> so just drive according to the recommended speed, knowing that during the rains, visibility is poor. Some of the time, the, um, uh, um, the street lights are not working, particularly, you know, uh, in trunk A roads, you know, the main expressways, and ensure that you check your vehicles, check your tires uh, before you get on the road such that you're safe. And, you know, your safety is also dependent on other road users. Well, it's raining, guys, this morning, but yeah, it's, it's not beautiful. raining as much as far as negotiations for the minimum wage is concerned. <laughs> I, I it's, trickling, we'll go there. it's trickling that area, actually, with an addition well, of just 6,000 naira mm -hmm. to what government is offering. And uh, that doesn't look very good when you consider that inflation, food inflation, um, is taller than the tallest building now. Cardi, what's that your expression? It is yeah. way taller than the tallest building. It's 40, mm -hmm. 40 floors if each percentage mm -hmm. were floor, mm -hmm. 40 floors. But you know when I told you guys that it looks like government is negotiating like Nigerian mothers? Mm. And this is just typical. Nigerian mothers? Yes. yes. Have I mean, you ever been negotiate. to the market with the yes. Nigerian mother haggling? Oh, okay. I get it. I get right. it. Right. When they haggle in the market, you start from something really high and they cut it down to Guilty as charged. ridiculously low. Guilty. And then they keep adding a little a bit. to it, a bit to it. At some point, you are just... You are you are you are embarrassed, right? They're standing with them. <laughs> Can we just do this and go? I know how much is in your pocket. I know a child that said, "But mommy, you have this money in your pocket." And of course, you know what happened after when they got home. But I think it's important to not waste time here because time is of the essence. There are people who need that money not today, not yesterday, months ago because this inflation has been biting consistently. So I'm not sure if this all part of the negotiation strategy, but this is tied to the lives of people. So we do not need to waste time. Tell us what you can afford. Give us a cap and let's move on from there. I don't like this. Uh, when, when I look at it, I'm really curious to know what I, I would like to talk to the Minister of Labor, the Minister of State for Labor. I have a Minister of Labor now. Minister of State for Labor. Uh, what is the premise of your negotiation? Because I know everything that Labour considered, from food to transportation to cost of living, 
to, to all of these uh, many things they listed, you know, even school fees, feeding, and all of that. And it came to that total that was about plus or minus inflation is about 615,000. So when government says 54 or 58 or 48 as they initially start, what exactly, what's the premise? How much is supposed to be used for transport, food? Uh, school fees, medicals, basic medicals, what exactly? But as we've always said, wrap this thing up. Let's move on. Time is of the essence. And you know what, Jeffrey and Kaidi, uh, what seems to be a sticking point in the negotiation is the fact that the governors are not around. And you know, um, what's the size of the workforce at the federal level as against what's the size of the workforce uh, in the states of the federation when the governors are not... Well, they have uh, a representation on the... They have a the representation, but if yeah, you I listen to the them. conversation uh, with the NLC president and uh, a reporter, uh, 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 I beg your pardon, political editor, yesterday, he says that the representatives do not have a mandate to commit to the negotiation. So that's a huge surge of doubt on what's on ground. Whatever the government is offering, will the state governors be committing to it? Don't forget that uh, the, some governors are still not paying the 30,000 naira minimum wage as it is already. And then the organized private sector, uh, have they, you know, opt their own, put a cap or increased what they're, what they're offering. And what's the uh, breakdown, you know? Help us have an understanding right. of the breakdown of their own 54,000 Naira initial offer. Uh, perhaps this will be the time, you know, for Labour to also look the federal government in the face and demand, you know, some form of accountability in the way of cutting down on cost of governance. You know, the size of the cabinet already uh, is large and government keeps prevailing on the workforce, you know, to tighten their belt. Perhaps this will be the time for government to also uh, lead by example in that regard. As Kade says, inflation is not waiting, and there are no guarantees that there will be no further increase in the price, pump price of petrol, on which every other thing hinges. So there should be a definitive move in that regard in the short term rather than the long term. All right, there's a lot we are going to talk about today. So those are the labor union, uh, labor, organized labor, I should say. Uh, uh, Kusu Joa Jira, the TUC man, I think Deputy Vice President or Vice President of the TUC. All right, Aluta Continua. Victoria said, as they say, so the fight continues. First, now 54,000. 54, we, we don't know what's going to be. Maybe next. the next negotiation that will continue to do the out 2K. <laughs> oh, Jeffrey, please be positive. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. But let's tell you what we have today on the show. I didn't just sit out. Like, Nigerian, just sit out live today. like Nigerian mothers. <laughs> Typical Nigerian mothers. Like, goodness me. Congratulations to the federal government for that strategy. Well, Labour is not backing down. Oops. Let's continue now. Now, in continuation of our series assessing the performance of this administration in the last one year, we focus on education, a sector that has been plagued in the past by industrial action, infrastructure challenges, and quality of outcomes. Today on the show, our major question is, is the Tinubu administration doing enough to reposition the fortune of the sector regarded as the bedrock of any society? We'll find out right here with the experts. There's more to find out on the program. This time, it's about the killings on the plateau. Yet again, uh, more fatal casualties have been recorded on the plateau. Well, the government is disputing that. But this follows a late Monday night attack by bandits that left 40 people dead in Wasi, local government area. Again, the government has disputed that figure. The sad tale of innocent lives being cut short smears on all our consciences. Can government and, uh, rise to the occasion to bring an end to this menace? That's a subject that we'll also be exploring today on the program. Plus, he is undoubtedly a trailblazer and an icon in the comedy industry. It's paved the way for successive generations of humor merchants in Nigeria. Well, he graduated at top in his class and has not slowed down ever since, despite of down times. Julius the, Juni <laughs> the Genius. Yeah, Julius the Genius is our guest on the sub side of things this morning. All right, so it's a packed show, not bumper like Bukola will say. I will not use that word. It's the same, Jeffrey. It's a, <laughs> it's a packed show. It's, a, it's the I same. Avoid those Lego kind of English that we use on television. But it's okay, we'll take this show. <laughs> we'll take this short break when we'll come back. We'll bring you our top stories. Join us again. With us. <laughs> Top
Top on the break this morning is a decision by the monetary authority to raise interest rate by 150 basis points to 26. 0.25% from 24.75%. This is the third consecutive increase by the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank to contain the consistent upward trend of inflation pegged at 33% for April. The governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Yemi Kadoso, who is the chairman of that committee, retained the cash reserve ratio, ratio at 45% and the asymmetric corridors around the rate is kept at plus 100 and minus 300 basis, a decision taken after its 295th meeting between May the 20th to the 21st to review recent economic development. The committee's decisions are as follows. One, raise the MPR by 150 basis points to 26.25% from 24.75%. Two, retain the asymmetric corridor around the MPR to plus 100 to minus 300 basis points. Three, retain the cash reserve ratio of deposit money banks at 45%. And four, retain the liquidity ratio at 30%. Well, tightening interest rate there. Let's move on now. It's another heartbreaking development on the plateau, especially for two villages of Zura Kampani and Bandalala in Wasa, local government area, who are still in mourning following the killing of about 40 persons by bandits. Some Wasa residents who spoke to channels television on the phone said the attacks on the villages occurred when residents were returning from the day's work. The bandits, according to the resident, attacked the villages simultaneously, setting ablaze houses leading to pandemonium where some of the residents were killed and some other sustaining injuries. Over 30 persons were reportedly killed in Kompani Zurak, while another 10 were killed in Bandalala, with several others still missing, although those figures are under dispute. And now to the nation's capital, the Senate has adopted a resolution to coordinate a national summit involving stakeholders, farmers, including herders as well, to address the issue of grazing. Farmers said that Clash Dow would guide the Senate in that necessary legislation on the matter. This resolution was taken after a motion sponsored by Senator Issa Jibrin on the need to rehabilitate four communities of Omala local government area in Kogi State affected by attacks and killings by gunmen. Senator Jibrin further disclosed that attacks on these communities have resulted in the killing of over 600 citizens, in addition to wanton destruction of public and private property worth hundreds of millions of naira. In the meantime, lawmakers in the Green Chamber are raising concern or alarm over security and safety at the country's airports following allegations of employment of incompetent personnel. The issue was raised as a matter of urgent national importance by uh, Honorable Jesse Onua Kalusi, and the House is asking the Minister of Aviation to carry out a comprehensive audit of all airport personnel. It is also asking the Minister of Aviation to mandate the relevant authorities to exempt members of the armed forces from toll gate fees and parking payments in airports across Nigeria, among other issues of national security uh, that were deliberated on at plenary. Minister of Aviation, a relevant agency, should conduct a comprehensive audit of airport personnel. The audit should include an assessment of qualified skills, qualification adherence to professional standards, and the report should be presented to this house within 14 days. Many airplane crashes, the bombs that were planted in there came from workers who come in there to do construction work or repair work. They are easily compromised outside. So I think this is very critical. Moving on now, the nation may inevitably be bracing for a looming industrial action after organized labor has rejected 54,000 now proposed by the federal government as minimum wage following a return to the negotiation table by a tripartite committee on the new minimum wage due to reported workout by the labor last week. At the reconvened meeting, the federal government made a fresh proposal to pay 54,000 as against the initial 48,000 naira it proposed during the last sitting. However, sources at the meeting, which held behind closed doors at the, nation, at the nation's capital, told Channel's television 
that the organized labor refused the new proposal, maintaining it's a far cry from the 615,000 Naira proposed by organized labor. The meeting was subsequently adjourned to today, May the 22nd, uh, for continuation of negotiations. Well, you can see that it is still not substantial compared to what you need to keep a family moving. Uh, there are various ways of expressing your displeasure on issues. Last time, we told them there was no case submission. And uh, in this matter again, we told them that there's nothing on the table, you know, when they moved to 54. And uh, the state governors we are missing in action. So we will be reconvening tomorrow in the afternoon, giving the governors benefit of doubt. They will tidy up, come up, and give justification to any figure they are mentioning. Because when you give a figure, you do justification to that figure and say, this is why we are doing this. And that is what Labour is still expecting from them. And I know that employers of Labour in the private sector may only be expecting that. Well, let's see how that plays out later on in the day. And to that ever intriguing rivers politics, where eight more commissioners have been sworn in to serve in the State Executive Council after they were screened and confirmed by the Victor Okujumbo led House of Assembly following their nomination by the governor. Among those sworn in are former commissioners who served in Mr. Nyeson Wiki's cabinet, including Dr. Peter Mende, who was the Commissioner for Energy and Barrister Eloka Tasia Madi, who served as Commissioner for Works. A former Commissioner for Commerce in the state, Mr. Charles Bekei, was also screened and confirmed. Uh, Governor Fubara asked the newly sworn in council members to serve with diligence and strengthen his administration's vision of upscaling the well being of rivers people as well as keeping records as much as possible. Last week, a senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Dagogo Iboroma, was the first to be screened and confirmed by the Victor Kojumbo led house, a letter sworn in by uh, the commissioner, sworn in by the governor following the, uh, after those divisions in the house. And let's inform you that retired police officers of the Nigerian, retired Nigerian police officers, I should say, under the contributory pension scheme converge on the premises of the National Assembly to protest over several months of unpaid pensions. The retired officers who came from different states uh, chapters bearing placards lament the hardship being experienced by their members over the failure of the pension commission to pay them their entitlement. The personnel who are no longer in service are asking the federal government to even remove them from the contributory pension scheme. In business, the central bank governor, Mr. Yemi Kadoso, has said although the Apex Bank is excited at the strides of fintech companies operating in Nigeria, there is need to ensure proper regulation, hence the need to clamp down. Mr. Kadoso gave his position while responding to questions from journalists after the MPC meeting. Recall that the central bank recently issued a directive asking fintech uh -huh. companies to stop uh, the onboarding of new customers due to rise in illicit financial flows and money, money laundering. Distribution of food on the foreign scene in Rafa by United Nations Agency for Palestine and Refugees has sus been suspended due to Israel's attack on the city and lack of supplies. According to Gaza's health ministry, 85 people have been killed and 200 injured in the latest last 24 hours. Uh, that's according to their report. The health ministry in Palestine also disclosed that about seven people, including a teacher and a doctor, have been killed in an Israeli raid on Jenin in the occupied West Bank. Moving well, now, now to sports, it's goodbye to Stamford Bridge for Mauricio Pochettino, who has left Chelsea by mutual consent just two days after the end of the first season in charge of the Stamford Bridge Club. Pochettino departs one year into a two-year deal and having finished sixth in the Premier League and winning their final five games of the season, his future was a subject of an internal end-of-season review with Chelsea's sporting directors Paul uh, Winston, Winston Stanley and Lawrence Stewart. Pochettino had voiced his frustration at a number of issues at the club during his first season, while Chelsea also uh, underperformed given their considerable investment in playing staff amid a lengthy injury list. So those are the stories we've been tracking, say, in the last 24 hours, and of course it's going to form or uh, shape part of our conversation for the rest of the day. Uh, but we'll now head back to you, I mean, on X, where 
You've been talking to us. Uh, Cardi joins me to bring you all of that detail. Cardi. Oh, yes, Jeffrey. Uh, let's just run through all of the things you're saying this morning. Quite uh, a busy one, absolutely. And we'll begin with the CBN uh, raising interest rates by 150 basis points to 26.5%. And this is coming amid soaring inflation levels. This has been a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. Should we raise? Should we hold? Should we reduce the inflation rate, or, or rather the, the interest rate? Now we've seen the decision that has been made. So the first reaction we're getting on this is from any lower or any lower, depending on the amion that is on it. It's not right here, but this is the reaction. Unfortunately, this will not help to control inflation. That's what this user thinks. However, Nigeria will experience an increase in non-performing loans, that's NPLs, leading to further erosion of our purchasing power. And this particular one ends by saying, our economists, this solution is not solution. Oh, ah, it's quite tricky what the, the CBN's uh, Monetary Policy Committee is faced with. Whatever decision you make naturally would get a lot of reaction. So you're left with the option of not doing anything, mm. and then people say, oh, you could have done something. Mm. Or you do something, and people are saying, no, you shouldn't have done something. It's really a tricky one. But I, let's I, I, th I think it's an argument about diagnosis. What exactly is pushing it? Is this cost push, demand pull, or a hybrid of both? Yeah. Uh, but apparently, they are trying to mop up as much as possible. But uh to taper this this is a stagflation literally in in my view but economists uh experts will be able to say exactly what this is but these numbers have to come down it's mm. not looking funny especially full inflation but let's find out what damilari adulacy is saying yeah how much will commercial banks raise their uh their rate i guess to on onto loans access bank currently charges seven percent interest per month on a 12-month loan, aside the main capital repayment is about 55% in total. Maybe commercial banks will raise theirs to about 80% interest rate per annum. And that's a conversation we need to sit down yep. to have, really. We need to have that one. But the next one is from Great Olasoji 1. And uh, essentially, this talks about uh, the question you've raised, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. One of the things driving uh, the cost of goods in this country. This user believes it's interest lane rate on loan. Most businesses in this country mm. are running on loan. Every small business owner is relying on loan. This will definitely increase their prices. Ends with a prayer. God bless Nigeria. All right, Colin Sakpara uh, says, how much more suffering do they want to inflict on ordinary Nigerians? I wanted to see that. Okay. Instead of uh, providing relief and solutions, they are making it harder for businesses and individuals to survive. This decision is a slap in the face for every hard-working citizens, citizens struggling to make ends meet or more. Okay. Just to give you a peek into how the Monetary Policy Committee works, they get to vote, mm. each of them, so it's not a decision uh, by the CBN government, person. and that's not even making a case for him. So each of them vote, and eventually the, the majority, majority mm. should carry the even day. If, so, even if it's by one. Exactly. So that's what's happening behind the scenes with this one. The man Zaman says, we understand this is the natural reaction, but he believes, or she believes, that... Uh, the cause of this inflation is on the supply side. Mm. So what do you do then? I think it will be important to see those solutions coming through. Believes that this increase will worsen the fiscal side and does not align with the monetary, if it does not align with the monetary side. In, fa in fairness or in truth, the truth is that uh, they are faced with a dilemma uh, between effects are creation, more like getting as much foreign exchange as possible. So when you increase interest rate, naturally people will Foreigners will come and put in their money because of interest rate, but it's going to be killing the local production because manufacturers have to borrow at higher interest mm. uh, to be able to run business, and that will push the price on all of us who are consumers. So okay. it's, it's a quagmire. Uh, Merck uh, says inflation is driven by food supply, not excess money supply. Inflation, okay, he said it like three times. <laughs> when will they learn? Okay, that's the diagnosis we're talking about. There's even a debate as to what is driving it. Yeah. Uh, it, it feels like a, a hybrid because some people are saying it's this, others are saying it's that. But let's move on now. <sighs> Absolutely. So let's turn our attention to the other side of things. I, I'll just call it the monetary side because it concerns money, right? Mm -hmm. Just pardon me to do that. And this is the fiscal side. You know, we just talked <laughs> on the fiscal side, rather. Uh, and this is about the negotiation between uh, Labour and the federal government. We touched on that earlier on. So from 48,000 Naira, that's the counter offer the federal government gave last week, 
the government has since increased it to 54,000 naira. If you do the math, it's a far cry from what Labour uh, put on the table originally, but of course Labour knew that that wasn't going to be the case. So this first one is from Ituma Sonny. says both, but in this case I think it's three because it's a tripartite committee, but we get the point. They shall try and reach a point that will be acceptable to all. 615,000 naira is definitely not going to be achievable. But 54,000 are proposed by government is rather embarrassing. So take a look at what this user is proposing. So this is a quadrupite. <laughs> 150 to 200,000 naira should be fair enough. The government will say, where will we have, where will we get the money to pay? Okay. Uh, Precious uh, says, what can 55,000 naira buy? How can it be less than the price of a bag of rice in Nigeria? When it comes to what people will benefit from they will hold meetings upon meetings. Well, it's called collective bargaining. Mm. Uh, just this evening, you guys increase interest rates without any consideration, no noise. <laughs> <sighs> you know, bag of rice is really making the rounds, yeah. uh, really. And uh, this next user references it again. Ebuka NW figures says 98 billion. For 90 Hajj, billion. 90 billion, rather, for Hajj. 10 billion uh, for National Assembly car park and 54,000 Naira. For workers that are making the money that they are looting, according to this user, uh, asks, can he buy a bag of rice? Can he feed a family of four comfortably? Those are the questions being asked and uh, essentially putting it out there. Javin, you said there's David Javin. He said, if we're talking about living wage, then 100,000 naira is fair enough. I, I hope you know that in this conversation that happened yesterday, the governors were not there. So we hope that the governors will be there because that's another kettle of fish uh, entirely. altogether. Kari, do you have the next one? Oh, yes. Uh, and this one is from uh, Lala Usiju. Uh, says, but Labour, too, should be more realistic and go for what FG will consider. Okay. We okay. know, this user says, that 600 is uh, essentially good but not feasible at all. Well, there's a lot you've been talking about, including the police officers, retired police officers. It's quite disheartening to see these men protesting. and women uh, protesting. They served Nigeria for at least 35 years. Um, having them to come out to demand for what is their right is quite painful. And we hope that the government will do something as quickly as yeah. possible. Because um, putting their lives on the line, essentially, mm. is not a joke. Uh, not many people will do it. That's why we give them the respect and the honor and everything we give to them, the next thing that Nigeria has to do for them is to make their living condition a little better. And the danger, Jeffrey, yes. is the fact that the current police officers serving right mm. now are watching. They are watching. And they're thinking, what will be my case when I retire? Yes. So it's important to ensure that we fix this so we don't send the wrong message to the ones still in service. So we thank all our servicemen for their service. And well, those are the ones we've been tracking for now. Keep that conversation coming. We'll take this quick break. When we come back, we'll start the conversation for the day. Join us again. Absolutely. Welcome back to the program. Uh, quite a conversation there with the guys. And uh, we're moving on to the first leg of our conversa conversation. And you know what they say about education is the most powerful weapon that you can use to change the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, back home, uh, you know, there's a consensus that when you solve the challenge of education, uh, you would have solved by a very huge percentage other challenges of insecurity and unemployment. Uh, but as we progress, we would like to look at the strides of the administration in the area of education, particularly as we approach the first anniversary of the Bola led government. And joining us to look at this, uh, we have two uh, educationists on the program this morning. We have joining us via Zoom, Professor Abiodun Adeshegun. is the chairman, Babcock University Schools Management Board. Good morning and welcome to the program. 
Good morning, Bukola. How are you today? Very well, thank you. And I'm glad that you can hear me. Uh, Professor Adesha, by the way, is also the former Dean School of Education and Humanities, Babcock University. Also joining us in our Lagos studio, we have Mrs. Boyede Adebanjo. She's an educationist. Good morning and welcome, madam. Good morning. Mm. It's good to have you. So I'm going to start um, with you. Uh, let's start, let's look um, holistically at some of the promises that uh, the administration uh, put forward at the beginning of, uh, the, the, at the onset of the administration. Uh, let's look at educational infrastructure. Uh, the administration promised to invest in infrastructure uh, of educational institutions and provide adequate resources. There's also accreditation standards and curriculum teacher training, just to mention a few. Uh, in the last one year, what are your thoughts on the investment of in these areas to improve the quality of education? Okay, um, I think that in terms of what has been released, um, the promises by the government, I think they're definitely along the right lines. Um, most of them are tilted towards the public sector um, and some of them we can see, you know, from looking from out, outside. I, I manage a, a private school, so I'm not in the public sector. But then I've seen that, yes, there's been some progress in um, refurbishing some of the public schools around us. Um, in terms of curriculum, there have been changes or promises of changes. Um, there's been an addition of history to the curriculum um, recently. Uh, I think in the last two years or so, which was a very welcome, um, you know, introduction. There's also been an increased um, push for cohesion in terms of curriculum and term dates and things like that. So I see that things are being done. Um, in terms of teacher training, there's been a lot of um, publicity around that. And in fact, people, I, I find that teachers now are more interested in becoming public school teachers. And I think that's because these promises are, um, look attractive um, to people. So it's, I mean, the promises are out there. There's, there's, um, we're seeing that things are being done, but we, we're looking forward to, you know, actually see, re reaping the fruits of those policies. And uh, these observations that you make, uh, just to uh, confirm, they are towards, you know, schools that are owned by federal government, uh, as against and across, state government and state government as well. Okay, let's come to you, Professor Adisha. I wonder if your observations are different or the same or more. Well, he did promise access to education via uh, student loan, which has kicked off now. And then he said that uh, the president said that we were, we we're not going to be having strikes by ASU any longer. You know, there was a recent threat of a strike when the governing councils of universities were not uh, inaugurated, and the government quickly did that. But beyond all of that, I think that uh, there is still a lot to be done. There is a lot to be done in the sense that the way we are approaching the issue of education is just using the same methodologies, and we will arrive at the same results. The fact is that we need to really revamp the educational sector. And after the Second World War, when Europe was devastated, the United States came up with what was called the Marshall Plan, which kicked off in 1948 and lasted in 1951. At that time, they poured $13.3 billion into Europe to rebuild infrastructure, to kickstart the economy and to bring a better life to all. We must all understand that education is the bedrock of development and industrial revolution. And we don't seem to understand that yet until we address the situation of education as if we are addressing a war-ravaged place that we now want to turn around, then we are not yet there. And for us to get there, we need to have the right vision. On May 25, 1961, President John F. Kennedy addressed the joint session of the United States Congress. And he said, it is our intention to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, that is by 1970. 
That was the vision. Mm. And everything was done to drive that vision so that even after his administration had gone and Lyndon Johnson had become president, it was achieved within the time frame for which it was said uh, it was projected. So what we need now in Nigeria is to have the vision that, okay, we want to develop this society. Education is so fundamental to everything that we need to say, okay, we need a truly Nigerian car in the next five years. I'm going to put all the experts together. I'm going to lock them up in a room and throw away the key. And they must come up with the solution so that in five years' time, we achieve the target of exactly what we want. Mm. What we are putting into education right now is like playing with kid gloves. Right. And when compared that, to what we do. And that's rather ironic. It looks like everybody appreciates, acknowledges the role that education plays in building a nation. I mean, from the society upward, but it looks like we're not doing what we ought to do in that line, particularly in terms of budgeting and the rest. But let's take a look at this next promise that was made uh, by this government before it came into power, and it's on accreditation standards and curriculum, which is key uh, to the standard of education you get across board. So take a look at what this government promised prior to coming into power. New accreditation standards will be developed for all institutions from the primary to the tertiary levels, all institutions of learning in Nigeria will eventually be required to comply with these new standards after a reasonable period of adjustment. So that was the major part uh, of that promise. And I'd like to come to you, Madam. We've talked about how it looks like the children learn or study one thing in school, and when they get out there, it's a different ball game entirely. And we've always talked about how we need to match what they learn in school, what they'll face in real life, particularly because the world is changing really fast. You know, what was obtainable 10 years ago since change? COVID came and literally took us 10 years into the future, working from home, artificial intelligence, and the rest. What are the things you'd like to see as a, an addition or an upgrade to our current curriculum in the country? Okay. Um, so I think generally the uh, our curriculum the nigerian curriculum is archaic in a, in a sense um it's it hasn't moved with times as you said and apart from the content of the curriculum the way that we expose the curriculum to the children is very important you know so instead of the like regurgitative method that we use say you know teaching children that this is yellow and then they repeat to us that this is yellow we should move away from that and into the children asking questions okay it, you say it's yellow but why why is it yellow how do we know it's yellow oh, what if we don't want it to be yellow those are the sort of questions that we need the children to be asking i mean this is a very simple example i'm using mm -hmm. but imagine children being able to ask questions like that in science in social studies they'll be you know they'll start to think of new things there will be innovation they would question the status quo and then they would be able to create new things for nigeria and that's what tends to happen in many um, societies where you know that are very innovative it's because people question they have critical thinking skills they're encouraged to have critical thinking skills it's infused in the curriculum it's infused in the way the teachers ask questions it's infused in in the sort of projects that the children are expected to do you know as opposed to just sort of learning and being able to repeat things, they need to be able to question it and prove it and do something new with it. Um, and I think that's what we really need to do with our curriculum at the primary school and secondary school stages. Um, apart from upgrading the content, you know, as you said, AI is yeah. uh, new. Do we have that in our Nigerian IT curriculum? We also need to change the way even the teachers think. Because if the teachers are not thinking this way, they're not going to encourage the children to think that way. So those changes definitely need to happen. I, I just want to ask, Prof, is it too early to expect a, a change in curriculum? a proper upgrade it's been one year uh, i know there's been that debate is one year enough to rate this government or not but education is not waiting the world is not waiting so is this something you expect that the government should have already gone far with in one year yeah in the dying days of the Wari administration the national universities commission initiated a new curriculum review which is called cc mass which the universities are are keen in it right now. 
But my thing with that is that, okay, so most of the, all the universities have the same curriculum. And I think this cannot make way for innovation, research, and real development in the sense that people have to have niches. You know, institutions have to have niches for which they are known for. For, like you said, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, and stuff like that. The curriculum that we are, that the new one now, because it's a new one that all universities have to key into, does not address those issues. And so we need to unlock the potentials of Nigerians and Nigerian scholars and the children to be able to compete with the best in the world. It is not rocket science because we see all what is going on all over the world. At this time, we see the innovations being made, and a lot of money needs to be put in research and development. In older universities across the world, they have endowments like Stanford, like MIT, like Harvard, like Oxford. So they have a lot of money in which they pour into research to be able to do groundbreaking work and create new things that are that are, that are happening there. So. We may not need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to give the universities more autonomy to determine which areas to want to be known for or to be best at so that they can really produce uh, groundbreaking work that can move our society forward at this time. All right, uh, let, let me come back to you. I, I may stay with you for a bit, Rob, because of uh, is a public sector here and this is quite critical one thing about education that is is very important is that if you don't invest now you see the impact tomorrow if you invest now you see the impact tomorrow so it's not something you can hide uh, so if we trickle down to the issue of teacher training which is quite critical this government in their promise had mentioned the fact that we will introduce new accreditation requirement for teachers in federally funded primary and secondary school standardized teaching courses and training courses as well as teacher welfare will be paramount under Tinubu administration. Teaching will be a rewarding career option for capable young graduates. So when you talk about teacher training, which is quite critical under uh, some of the quality education for all promise that they've made, how much of that are you seeing? And will, in the last one year, have they done enough? Because we're doing one year now. Have they done enough to attract the kind of young people into that space as much as possible, given what is playing out with labor and the federal government in terms of negotiation? Yeah. We have the Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria. And Bangkok University, my university, is one of those that are training teachers at the moment for the wider society. So people go into that and they come up with a certification to be teachers and they are, you know, professionally qualified to, to actually do the job. Such as much as um, you having ICANN inducting chartered accountants. So this is where the, the way things are going in the country at the moment. But we still need to attract the right type of people into the teaching profession, as you said. People see it as a last resort. If they don't get a job in the oil company or some other mega company, then they look at teaching and say, well, you know, maybe hey, I should go into that. But you don't have first class graduates, for instance, going to teaching. And this is not the way to go. So we need to make teaching more attractive by increasing the remuneration and the incentives and the training both locally and internationally to attract the best brains in that business because don't forget that these teachers are the ones that will train doctors, that will train lawyers, that will train scientists, that will take engineers. So this is the bedrock of everything and um, we need to really address it and ensure that the right type of people are the ones teaching and we are getting uh, the required output from their productivity. Madam, I know you play in the private space, so my question exactly is, are you seeing enough being done from, I'm sure you have colleagues in the public sector, because mostly of some of these things are in the public sector. Are you seeing enough being, being done in one year to train teachers, teaching the, is it training the trainer, or that's what it's called now? 
Um, I haven't seen enough to make me think that it's, a, you know, a great job has been done. Um, I've heard enough to think that at least we're on the right um, track, but I haven't seen enough. And definitely we need more training. Um, and beyond training, and I keep saying this, beyond training, we need other things to work to help teachers and students to be able to even imagine certain things. So a student who doesn't have power at home and is learning, by the way, I, I understand that Lagos State wants to introduce some, um, or ha is in the process of introducing robotics at primary and secondary school um, level, so that's a good thing. But then a child who is learning robotics in school goes home and doesn't have power or a teacher who is teaching robotics in school goes home and doesn't have power to do much more than the maybe 30 minutes that they're doing in school. How much more can they really do with what they're learning? You know, so it's even a lot more than the salary that the teachers will collect. It's, you know, having a functional society working so that people can expose themselves to, you know, things that would improve their work in, in, in teaching. You know, I, I, I think that's very important. It's, it's not even just about the salary. It's about that quality of life that will give somebody the peace of mind to research a bit more on their own, to, you know, see what's happening in Singapore and try to replicate or even do better here. But if you don't even have the power, or, you know, data, da data is an issue, how do we really want to get into doing the best that we can? Uh, and, you know, teacher training is perhaps directly connected to this next layer of promise by the administration, which is school management. Um, the, the administration promised that new managed system for federally funded primary and secondary schools in Nigeria, such schools will be managed by boards of education. And you, perhaps you could also tie that to uh, the recent um, outcomes of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the joint admissions and matriculation board examinations that students sat for, where 76% uh, uh, scored below 200, which was a dismal performance. So if you look at those layers of promise, teacher training, uh, under school management, would you say, maybe I should come to you now, Prof, because you are the one receiving the students into the universities. So would you say that uh, school management um, uh, has been delivered under this promise, uh, as particularly from federally owned secondary schools? Would you say that teacher training and school management, that promise has been delivered? Uh, well, I think there is still a long way to go. Uh, mm. with regards to this, because the quality of students that we receive keep, keeps dropping by the day. And we begin to wonder, how are we going to manage these students in the university, you know? But what is coming to the fore is that JAM is using more scientific methods to conduct their exams, and the real performance of those students are coming out for everybody to see, you know? when people can no longer cheat. Those of them that come to Babcock University to take the jam exam, we put them where we have CCTV and all of that, and then we ensure that we, we, we are not one of those that have been called the miracle center for someone to come and score 350, you know, by stealth. So a lot of work needs to be done mm. at the primary and secondary school level to produce the right quality of students to be able to, you know, compete very, very well with their counterparts in other parts of the world. But having said that, uh, parents also need to kick in. For instance, we read in the news that there was a father that was caught writing the jump for his very world. How can that be? You know, because are you coming to the university also to write exams for your son or what? So these things have to be checked. The parental attitude has to be to, to be corrected, and students have to be helped to understand that they need their, their dignity in hard work and labor, so that they can achieve what they want on their own. Nigerian students are not dull, but they need to be guided and to be helped to be able to do what is good and what is right. And so far as I can see. In this last one year, we have not done well in that area at all. <sighs>
eventually we'll tally the scores. Since we have educators here, we'll tally the scores <laughs> and come with, the, come up with the final score for this government in the past one year. But I want to go to an issue which is very vital as well, and it concerns funding. And this is one of the promises made, Special Education Fund. It says, through new legislation, government will establish a special education fund consisting of zero coupon federal bonds. Those are not terms that are popular here, coupons, for example. But that's what the government promised uh, when it comes to uh, funding the education sector. Went on to say that through this, uh, essentially various mechanisms, bonds will be sold in tranches to private investors uh, purchased in market clearing exercises by the CBN. And this government believes it will help fund uh, the education sector. Uh, I'll come to you, Madam, in the studio, because we've seen it looks like the, the private sector, when it comes to education, is doing quite well when it comes to funding. And it's a no-brainer. The private sector charges way more mm -hmm. than the public sector. But when it comes to public goods, people wouldn't want to pay as much because people who approach public goods are people, most times, who can't afford to pay as much in the private sector. So if this is the thinking for government, it's possible that, of course, the cost of education in the public sector will go up. And that's why we're seeing the student loans. There should be more funding there. But if there's anything you think government can borrow from the private sector in terms of funding and utilizing the funds appropriately, what is that thing you think it should be? Maybe we can incorporate this while the government is working on it. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, I think that the government needs to recognize that even if they're funding um, public schools, there needs to be... The, value created and even if you're not looking to make a profit from something the thing must return um some you know va some value some value yes and if you place a priority on that then whatever it is you are pumping into it whether it's one naira or 10 million naira then there's somebody there that's following it through because what we find is that we do the, the country generally raises funds for different things um but somewhere along the way it gets lost and it never really reaches those people that it's um for and in the private sector that wouldn't happen because somebody has worked hard or taken a loan to get these um monies and <clears throat> there must be a return on that investment. So I think what we really need to do is the proper monitoring. So it's, it's, it's okay to say we're going to have some, um, a certain amount put towards um, government schools, but who is actually monitoring it? Who is actually making sure that those things are going towards what they're supposed to do? And who is recording impact? Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to see. 76% failure rate at JAM is, is, is terrible. It should be flipped around. You know, it should be 76% pass rates. Um, so I think monitoring and recording impact is important. It's not enough to just announce, oh, we have pumped a certain amount of money into public schools, which is what we tend to see. What we need to see is, what we need to hear is the results. We pumped in this amount, and this is what it resulted in after five five years. I think that's, that, that's what's key. If there is someone monitoring it and ensuring that it's going to the right people. All right, Prof, <coughs> let, let, let's come to you now, Prof, on this uh, next one, which has to do with student loans. By the way, uh, the issue of school management board, I see that when it comes to the promises of this administration, they, they are big on primary and secondary. School management board, by their thinking, is to ensure that there's independent thinking, so that if you have a school management board, a governor cannot just go and sack a principal because the person came late to work. It's a board that will do that. Maybe you speak to that. But let's talk to uh, the, one of the things he says, students' loan, which is what literally everybody uh, is quite familiar with. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, repealed and reenacted, and we've seen it was going to take effect in the next 48 hours. Uh, but there's something he said in the campaign promise. He said, As, at the same time, this will give institutions the ability to charge more cost-reflective tuition fees. So it looks like there is going to be autonomy in, in the works, which is why this is introduced first, more like this first before that. So I want you to speak to the issue of these students' loans. Some have criticized it. Some have said it's a good step in the right direction. What exactly do you see when it comes to the issue of students' loan? Thank you, Jeffrey. I think uh, it's a step in the right direction to create more access 
for people to to have the education that they want. But um, you know, in the past 24 hours, they have made a clarification that no, this is not only for federal public schools. Uh, is is stage by stage. At the stage, we are going to involve uh, state schools, and I I didn't hear anything about involving the private schools in these things. And I just laugh because the 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 students in private institutions are Nigerians as well. Let's go back to the third form, which is contributed by private companies in Nigeria. Yet. Private institutions do not have access to TED form. It stands on, it stands on its head in, in logic that private institutions contribute this money and the private uh, schools that other Nigerians patronize do not have access. Why? There are equally Nigerians that can contribute to what is going on in the public space. Be that as it may, you know that there's been a lot of criticism that uh, you put five billion in a student loan and then you put 90 billion in Prigme to, to Mecca. So we need to just readdress our priorities and make sure that every Nigerian child, regardless of the institution that they attend, have access because they all have a lot to contribute to our commonwealth as a country. Ideas can come from anywhere. Innovation can come from anywhere. Good research can come from anywhere. And we need to tap into all these things and fund these things properly. And like uh, Mr. Adibanjo has said, make sure that uh, you get value for money. Let me tell you that at Babcock, if people say, oh, yeah, Babcock is one of the expensive schools. No. We have an IPP, that independent power project that supplies 24 hour power, you know power to the campus so you don't go to the place and you begin to wonder what am i going to do is that going to be power or not you go to many of our universities and institutions every department has a generator at the back of the head of the department's office and then everybody puts on their generator at every the same time there is smoke everywhere there is a lot of noise bedlam of noises all over the place while trying to study it is unacceptable. So we need to fund both the institutions and the students. Do you know that in my time when we were in the university, there was a bursary award that was given to students. This, is, this was not even a loan. It is just bursary you are given. Whether you are in private uh, institutions or public, you got that thing. And that suddenly it just died down. And Nigerians don't have access any longer. I think the situation should be reversed in such a way that we are able to get the most benefit from, you know, the money that we spend on education. As I said at the beginning, education is the bedrock of development. Nigeria cannot develop if it plays short shrift to education. We have to fit, take the bull by the horns and say, okay, this is where we want to get to. And this is what we want to do in the next five years, in the next 10 years. We want, uh, you know, robotics to be fully uh, accepted in Nigeria and all of that. And then we work towards it to achieve what we want. Right. So by now, we should be talking of a truly Nigerian car, not, you know, importing CKDs from, uh, from China or Taiwan and putting them together and saying this is a car made in Nigeria. What is that? We should be able to manufacture all the parts of the cars and put the car together right here in the country. And we can only do that if we fund research and development to the extent right. that... Prof, let's, let's bring know, it to the studio. Uh, no, no, I, I needed your take because if there's any promise made and about to be fulfilled mm -hmm. is the student's loan because it takes off on the 24th, uh, which is Friday. So I needed your take on what you see. I think it's definitely a good idea because um, it, it, it opens up access to some people who would never have had the opportunity. Um, but then the process, it seems the process of actually getting the loan is a tough one, which excludes 
many people, the people that probably actually really need the loan. Because you have to know um, certain people in you know, certain positions, and I believe that that would exclude some people. But uh, nonetheless, it's a good start. We have some people that have um, apparently been able to sign on. Um, but let's see how it works out. I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Um, let's see how it works out. And more importantly, how do they plan to get the monies back from these students? Um, I know that in other countries, the, the, um, the market for, um, the job market is buoyant mm -hmm. and people are more or less guaranteed to get a job and then it means that they're guaranteeing, um, you know, payment back. How do we want to deal with that? How, how does that work? Um, that I'm still not very clear on how that would work in the future, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And well, just to quickly add that, uh, you know, you know, the uh, bill went for another amendment mm. before it became a uh, law uh, eventually, and you know, some of the um, bottlenecks were removed. Speaking of which, um, one wa one was. Um, removing the threshold of in income for families that qualify to access the loan. Uh, so it's still going to be tested. And that's why I want to stay on uh, the student's loan uh, pr pr promise as a deliverable by the administration. Uh, because if you look at the manifesto, as Jeffrey quoted earlier, it's, it's as if they're putting one before the other, after which the universities will now be granted uh, the liberty, you know, f to uh, charge fees. Uh, Prof. Is there, is, is there any concern within the university community in that regard? Uh, because, you know, ahead of the uh, legislation on the student loan, there had been plans announced by the government for university autonomy for universities. Uh, so in that regard, are there any concerns that uh, there would be onward suspension of funding of federal tertiary institutions uh, by the administration? And uh, how do you think uh, the university leadership, uh, ASU and the likes, would react to this if that would be the case or if that would be the intention of the federal government upon the implementation of the Students' Loan Act? Thank you very much, Bukola. I think uh, the answer is in your question. There's a lot of concern that what the government is trying to do is to divest itself from funding education. At the stage of our development right now, we cannot afford to do that. Because government is a big player in the educational sector. And they need to give a direction as to where we want to go. And so they must continue to fund these institutions until the institutions are able to stand on their own and, and get endowments from corporations and companies for which they work and all of that to be able to, to do what they need to do. You know, when Japan was transiting from a feudal agrarian society to an industrial society, it was the government, the Japanese government, that took the bull by the arms to establish the institutions, the secondary schools, the primary schools, the universities. They were all publicly owned at the beginning. And they poured a lot of money there to ensure that the target that they wanted was achieved. And that was that they wanted to copy the West. Okay, we don't need to reverse the wheel. If the West is doing this way, let us just go that way at the very beginning and then see what we can do. And you find that those merchant families in Japan back then, the Toyodas, the Mitsubishis, and so on, these were people that were involved in agriculture. They are now the technological giants of the same country today because they have evolved over time. So it takes time before government can win the universities away from, you know, the funding that they provide. So they need to provide that funding, and they need to provide the same funding for private institutions. Because students from those places also serve in the National University Service Corps Scheme, the NYSC. They contribute to the country, as I was saying. So everybody needs to get involved one way or the other. Maybe you might not fund infrastructure in private universities, but you can fund research and development, fund research, so that people can do groundbreaking research. The money will not be an object into, you know, going pell-mell into the laboratory and producing something that is reasonable. You know, we they talked about, you know, uh, encouraging STEM education, which is fine. 
But we need to walk the talk and do that. And then we don't need to forget the humanities. Because this is what makes us human. Right. If you neglect the arts and the humanities, then you get into trouble. If you if if you if you if you train an accountant and you do not give him also the same training ethically, he doesn't know God and he, he has no ethical or moral values. You have just created a clever criminal. You've given him the tools to be able to work and uh, because he doesn't know good from bad, he's not going to do very well. So you cannot neglect the culture, the language and religion in education. You have to bring everything together to form a holistic a holistic package. You know, the, the essence of this conversation really, uh, having both of you on board, is to sort of learn on both sides, public learning from uh, the, the private, particularly because we've seen the private able to replicate across board and keep that momentum. Uh, so using that kind of view to look at what the government is doing, uh, obviously it will be very vital to helping to contribute a robust uh, you know, angle to this conversation. But there's something I'd like us to speak to. We've talked about funding, but then the cost itself is also a big part of this conversation. Are we paying too low for education in Nigeria? Are we paying too much for education in Nigeria? Now I ask because you're in the private sector and it's been said that the private sector, people are paying too much and that's why a lot of people cannot afford. But on the flip side, in the public sector, we've said people are paying too low and it's hard to invest in that sector if you're paying too low. So is there a middle ground we can come to here, Prof, before I come to you, madam? Thank you very much, Kaudi. Uh, My view is that we are paying too low. If we say we are training a medical doctor with uh, 250,000 naira per annum, it's a huge joke. What are we talking about here? You know, so we need to see what is the what are the cost components of what is being offered. All right. So you find the, the private sector charging realistic fees because many of them provide 24 hour power supply by themselves as i mentioned then you know you provide food and accommodation parents who pay less in institutions that are public also have to pay for their children's education in town i mean the accommodation in town they have to have money for food separately which, if they had everything together with the transportation to the university from the outside hostel to, to, to the campus and all of that, and if you add everything together, it boils down to the same thing. That you have a university that is, is fully accommodating the students, is feeding them three square meals a day and all of that. You add all that money together with the money parents pay by going to places where they have to rent houses for their, their, their wards and they have to provide food for them and you look, put the cost together, they all balance out, they are almost the same. And let me tell you that, yeah, for some of us, we recognize the inclement economic situation in the country. Right. And a place like Bako, for instance, we allow students to pay instrumentally. You don't have to pay all your school fees at once. Uh, but but you have to agree to say, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to pay three times, and then, right. you know, even the child of a pepper seller can have access to that education. Okay, uh, that might be a premium pepper seller at this <laughs> rate, because that debate has, has been a thing. Even though some will also fall to your calculation and say, well, it's not quite the same for us uh, in the public uh, sector, but this is a conversation we must have. We need let to me, define, let me tell you something. We need to define I, I, education, I, 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 Prof. I, Mm. Just, just mm. answer this, and I'll come to Madam. So, is education yeah. meant to be a social, will I call it, an, a social amenity, or just leave it as, um, as what it, some people say it should be, just like every other goods and service that the price is de de determined by demand and supply and the cost itself. Education is a social service. There's no doubt about it because doing anything less, providing, not providing as a social service will lead to chaos in the society. And, you know, those students that we don't train, we end up, you know, destroying the entire civilization and society. So people must have access to it. 
and the debate is what are the best ways to ensure that access. <laughs> the student loan is a, is, is a start, but it needs to be better funded than what it is now. And universities need to come up with uh, not just you know charges in terms of school fees, but look for ways to get sponsorship from uh, corporate organizations. If you do research for, let us say, Nestle, Nestle PLC, if a university is doing research for them, they will fund that research to, to a large extent. So we need to look for places that can give endowments to universities so that everything is not based on school fees alone. Okay, pardon me to so come in here, Prof. It, and let me bring in uh, uh, our guest to the studio. Pardon me, Prof. Your thoughts on this? It has been a debate ongoing. If it's a social amenity, then it should be not just accessible but affordable. Okay, um, I agree with Prof. It's definitely a social service and it should remain a social service. But I also think that, um, especially at university level, tertiary education level, it's people are not paying enough. Um, I mean, 250,000 for a medical um, degree is what are we really expecting from that? But I think the issue is not so much how much it costs, but how are we funding it? The government needs to put good money towards education, one. Two, it needs to encourage um, companies, wealthy families, wealthy people to create these endowments that Prof is talking about. That's how it's done in other places. Education is not cheap, even in countries where um, students get free education. It's still not cheap. Someone is paying for it, you know. So it's an issue of we need to pay, we need to pay the universities well, but who is pay, making these payments? We can't expect the child of a pepper seller to pay, you know, a huge amount. But if we recognise that that child has um, promise, that child has great results, then there should be a system in place that allows that child to be able to access the next level of education, and that's where the government comes in. I, I don't think that the government can completely divest, you know, from, from education, no. And then there should be encouragement for private institutions and wealthy people um, to adopt a wing, medical school, or to adopt um, the business school of a certain university, you know, things like that. And then it will be paid for. Absolutely, because we see in Harvard, initially, some people think it's all about scholarship sometimes in Harvard. They have legacy admission as mm -hmm. well. If, if your father can give Harvard, say, $2 million every year, uh, your chances may be high because, of course, they call it legacy admissions and all of that. Just have some bit of intelligence and that can pave the way. Uh, Prof, there's another part to this conversation which is more like um, what gives you the biggest flag, which has to do with the welfare of university teachers. Uh, ASO has fired the initial shot while looking at them just like we're looking at labor, how hard it's going to play out. And we've seen situations where ASU, I think SANU and all of the uh, unions uh, go on strike over issue of welfare. And if there's anything this government has to do going forward, because this is one year down the line, uh, everybody's been asked to be patient, but we don't know how long people can be patient when it comes to the difficulty people are facing. What can the government do to stop incessant strike? From the records we have between 1999 to 19, 2000, 2023, ASU went on strike for about 16 times. And if you calculate the number of days, it's about four years plus. It has to stop what can be done by the Tinubu administration to put an end. Yeah, I think uh, a lot can still be done. When you talk of welfare, first of all, you are talking of the wages of university teachers and workers. It needs to be benchmarked against you know what is happening in other countries because if you don't want them to, to leave the shores of Nigeria, what you call the Japa syndrome, where people just leave, then you have to benchmark what you are doing with what is going on elsewhere. And that is to ensure that these people are comfortable. Mr. Adiban just mentioned Singapore the other time. Uh, you know, that's one of the places where teachers are the highest paid in the whole planet. And you talk of the, the Nordic countries, Norway and Sweden and all of that. So you need to pay these people very well because they are the ones that will produce the medical doctors, they will produce the engineers, the lawyers, and all other professionals that you have out there. So that, one, that is one aspect. The other aspect is to provide 
a conducive environment for learning, which is to have an interrupted power supply and to have enough money to do research and to create the ambience that will, you know, enthuse students to study. But where you have uh, dilapidated buildings and you have uh, you don't have reagents in laboratories and uh, things are not functioning very well, the toilets are bad and all of that, and you expect the students not to misbehave, of course they will misbehave. Teachers also will misbehave. But if all these things are taken care of, then, you know, we have what is very close to the ideal, and we we can now task them. You can you can set targets that you know want you to produce something. Like during COVID, how many of our universities were able to produce a COVID vaccine? Other universities all over the world were producing, you know, in conjunction with uh, you know companies, AstraZeneca and the uh, and the Pfizer and the other companies and all the rest of them. So we need to create that conducive environment, the take-home pay must take the workers in the universities and in the, in fact, the workers of Nigeria generally. So this issue that I had you say this morning that, uh, okay, the minimum wage is not 54, 7, 54 naira. I don't think we are, we are serious at all. Judging by the level of inflation that we have had in the last one year, to me, a minimum wage should not be less than 100,000 because people have to survive. And you don't want them to go corrupt. You don't want them to go rogue and be stealing from the institutions and the places where they work. If you don't pay people well, we are tempting them to, 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 to commit things, which they should not. And that's what's happening all over the place, that uh, people say, oh, well, my, my welfare is not well taken care of. When I retire, my pensions and gratuities will not be paid, so I might as well take care of myself and find some other means. All right, Prof. So a lot of be done here, please, and we need to do it now. The time is now. It's an urgent thing that needs to be done now. I, I, I know you're also in the private sector, but I need you to weigh in, because at the end of the day, uh, we're all in the same society. Uh, when, you, when the students leave your school or leave uh, Babcock or leave any private university and probably all of us meet in the same marketplace, mm. So this happens, hap affects all of us. What can be done to stop this, you know, cutting short our calendar? What do you mean? I mean, ASU, okay, okay. Strikes. strikes. You have that consistency I mean, in the private yes. sector. It's not a question at all. Okay. Um, so I think it comes down to teacher welfare. Um, I mean, if, it, if, if, if they're supposed to be remunerated, you know, well, properly, um, for a teacher to leave their house, get into rush hour traffic, um, and come in, because it's not an easy job teaching a classroom full of children. So it needs to be, they need to be well paid. They need to be well paid to do the job properly. And it's, we've, we're, we've established that it's a very important job. We've established that without teachers, without professors, the country probably would not move forward because there would be no growth. Um, so definitely there needs to be stable, um, uh, remuneration, high remuneration, what that is, I cannot say here, mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be consistent. I mean, it's not fair for people to work and then they have to wait maybe three months to collect um, their salaries. Now, the minimum wage, I know that Prof has said that it should be about 100,000, which would be nice, but how practical is it to jump from where we are now to 100,000? Because this would also impact pr private companies. You know, wh where, where are those, com th those companies are also operating in Nigeria today. How, are they, how is their payroll supposed to triple, um, you know, almost overnight if that happens? So a lot needs to go in, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, we can't just focus on the teachers' salaries. A lot needs to go into the way the government is run for the economy to thrive, and then we'll be able to afford these things. But it's definitely something that we should do. Teachers need to be paid well. Well, I imagine that the job of a, a lecturer is a Herculean one, mm. um, having to engage with about 100 students in class, having to mark scripts, having to continually do research, uh, having to teach uh, those uh, 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 students, you know, and. Um, very, very demanding, if you mm -hmm. ask me. So, uh, you sound like should, a lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> there should be a reconsideration mm. in that regard. Uh, but 
I, I'd like also to look at another aspect of, um, you know, our curriculum uh, against the backdrop of this thinking that, um, you know, education is a scam. Um, I wonder if there is a very viable alternative in that regard, which would be vocational uh, education. And there is a lay of promise also from the administration as far as that is concerned. Uh, speaking of which, as contained in the manifesto, the promise is to reform and uh, reform of technical and vocational learning institutions to stimulate Nigeria's natural entrepreneurial spirit and empower more individuals towards self-reliance. I wonder if you're seeing any activity in that regard. And should it, even in the first place, be an alternative to uh, the thinking that education is a, uh, is a scam. Um, are we directing, you know, um, our education towards the outcome of alignment with global practices? I'll start with you in the studio, mm -hmm. madam. Um, I definitely don't think education is a scam. Um, but what I do think is that education comes in different forms. And in Nigeria especially, we tend to focus on a university degree being the ultimate. The truth is that we're all very, four of us sitting here are all very different. And I could take a completely different path and turn out just as successful as somebody who goes to university and studies to be a med um, medical doctor. Um, so we definitely need to explore alternatives. We need to make sure that those alternatives are attractive. We need to make sure that when th those people attend, I, I, you know, I think there's schools for like, you, you know, electricians and things like that. When they attend those schools, there should be a clear difference between an electrician that has attended such a, an institution and an electrician that just learned from maybe his neighbor. There should be a clear difference. And this is what would help that electrician to charge a bit more for his labor. And that's when we'll start to see a difference. You know, people will then step up to say, okay, I can't go to university, but I can learn, you know, to, to do something different and do it well, and I would be able to be well paid. Um, I think we definitely need to drive those alternatives. Not everybody has to do jam, not everybody has to go to university, but are there, you know, viable <coughs> alternatives for everybody, because there should be. Prof, I imagine that you'd have some uh, thoughts on this as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, Mr. Adibanjo has said it all, that we need to provide alternatives in order to ensure that we all grow together. There are certifications that people can do in certain professions. So those who don't go to tertiary institutions can do that. But those who are in tertiary institutions, like uh, polytechnics and all, we need to rejig what we are offering them so that the, their contemporaries don't look down on them and people don't mm. see the polytechnic as a dumping ground. There's no reason that, you know, polytechnic cannot offer degrees, Bachelor of Technology degrees and other specialized degrees for people who are in the professions, you know, whether electrical engineering or electronics or whatever that they are doing. And that's why, and you know, a place like MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is world famous. And all the poly polytechnics abroad now are offering degrees. They are not offering HND any longer. So for those who choose to go that route or that path, we need to encourage them and ensure that we streamline their curriculum in a way that they will also earn the degrees that their counterparts in universities are earning and they will get uh, parity in payment and all of that. And for those who don't have that opportunity, as I said, certification is the way to go. There are people that are certified in, in uh, IT, in computer science, in uh, AI, artificial intelligence and other things, and they are employed by organizations all over the world and they are well remunerated, sometimes even remunerated as much or more than those who have university degrees. That's the way to go. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to know what is working outside our country, and we need to adopt the same thing for the country and move forward from there. But the way we are going now, we are doing the same things and expecting a better result. We're not going to have that. If you pay a teacher a proper salary, then you should be expecting uh, <laughs> productivity at the proper level. It will not be world class. 
It will not be best in class. It will not be, you know, in line with global best practices. And this is where we need to go. We need to benchmark ourselves with the very best. You know, there was a time uh, several years ago I went to South Africa. After they, they had the, the, the World Cup there, I think they had the World Cup in 2010, and this was 2014, and I saw the level of roads that they had built. I went to Cairo also, I saw the same, the, the, the kind of roads that they have built there. I want to tell you today that the roads to Itro Airport in the UK are not as good as the ones in Cairo and the one in Johannesburg, which means that, that the Africans have the capacity to do better if they are determined to do it. And here in Nigeria, we must have that determination. We must have that vision. It starts with the vision that I want to make this country the Japan of Africa, and then we'll be able to achieve it through oh, well. all these measures that we're talking about. That's the ultimate dream, but it appears as if uh, there's a long distance to cover as, that, as far as that is concerned. And it also seems like a, uh, an all-consuming uh, task, task, really, and uh, we really do not envy the government, but they ask for it. But just before we wind down, and in 10 seconds each, I'd like you both to give a mark to the administration. Uh, so I'm going to start with you, madam. Um, over 100. This is what you do every This is what we do. So education in the last one year. Education in the last one year, improvement from, uh, I suppose, the beginning. Um, I probably won't give a mark past half mark um, because we've heard promises, but we're yet to see truly how it's playing out. Um, so 50% less or less? Yes. <laughs> less, yes. Okay, <laughs> I sense a lack of commitment there, but it's okay, we'll accept that. Prof, what would you give? Over 100%. I will give them 50%, which is a C. 50%? I think that's what they have. Yes. All right, that's good enough to reflect on. We'd like to thank you very much, uh, Professor Abiodun Adeshegu. Um, he's the chairman, Babcock University Schools Management Board, former dean, School of Education and Humanities, Babcock University. Thank you so much, sir, for your time and commitment to this cause. I would also like to thank you very much, madam, uh, Mrs. Boyede Adebanjo, educationist. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Thank you. Uh, because of the importance of the subject, we're continuing after this time out, yet again looking at the strides of the administration in the education sector. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Education is still in focus. One year down the line, how has the Tinubu administration done? But if you're doubting anything is done, the student loan is one of the things that has been a subject of debate. It's going to kick off on the 24th, which is just 48 hours from now, Friday, May the 24th. Uh, that's when everybody who is interested, they say they will start the first phase with, of course, uh, students of tertiary, tertiary institutions, 1.2 million or so, and some disbursements have been made. That's why we're having this conversation with the president of the National Association of Nigerian Students, uh, Mr. Loki Emanofe. Mr. Emanofe, thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah, good morning and good morning to viewers. All right, g g give us uh, uh, some sense of what uh, is in the works. Uh, there's a lot of conversation going on, uh, but you have been around this uh, issue for yeah. as long as it started. 24th is just 48 hours from now. How is the student community receiving this news? Yes, it's a new dawn. It's a new uh, development we are excited. Nigeria students can wait uh, for the kickstart of this process. And uh, we've long waited for this. And uh, we are happy that we want to begin it this time around. And we thank those who have put all effort together to ensure that we are coming to the full implementation of this uh, student list. So it's a good development in the education sector. We are receiving it with all excitement and joy as students of Nigeria. 
Uh, the students are aware that based on the campaign promises, this is perhaps preparatory grounds for the autonomy of university, which may mean uh, that education may be a bit more expensive in the future. Yes, uh, the beauty of it is the access to education, the students are aware, but even before this, I think there are steps we took. I think we, we presented an issue during the public hearings that uh, this may lead to increment in tuition fee by management. We met with the ministry and we are trying as much as possible to ensure that management don't increase tuition fee because of the fact that government want to assist or government want to cure those expenses. Because there are some persons who don't want to apply for the student loan. Let it still be affordable for them as well too. We understand that this may lead to increment in tuition fee and other uh, charges in the school uh, environment. But that's why NANS is always here to monitor, to continuously advocate advocate for the interests of students so that it will not be a big body on those who are not applying for the loan. Uh, and, you know, we had begun to see uh, increase in school fees uh, even ahead of uh, the implementation of the Students' Loan Act. And uh, one just wonders if um, it would not, you know, become prevalent across universities after the Students' Loan Act has become has come fully into force. But talk to us about the amendments that have been put in place, uh, removing the uh, eligibility threshold for families that can access the loans and, uh, you know, uh, the two-year uh, uh, grace period for which the applicant can return the loan. How satisfactory are these amendments, you know, to the uh, students' union body and students in general? Yes, uh, those cubersome uh, condition has been totally removed. If you look at the advertisement, the condition given by the Nelford now, it's just simple. Anybody can assess that. BVN. By a student of a higher institution, you can assess that. You don't need uh, your parents to belong to to earn so high number of salary, or you must belong to a big man or recommendation from a high level person in the society. No, those things have been removed. Then on the issue of a repayment plan, two years after NYC, if you are not working yet, the nail form, that is the law, make provision for uh, extension. So you can swear affidavit in court, that look at it, I'm not working. I think the NEFOD will consider additional three years, that is from that two years to five years as well. Then when you start working, it is 10% of your salary. So it is easy now for Nigeria students to assess it. It is not uh, rigid any longer. So it is easy. So we are happy with that already. Right, so income thresholds removed, guarantor removed. So those are some of the bottlenecks, uh, hurdles that you had identified uh, earlier on. But in the previous conversation we had, just before you came on, uh, we had, you know, representative from a private university. And the call is for also private universities to benefit from this. I understand that the government said state uh, universities will benefit in this phase two of the rollout, but as of now, 1.2 million uh, students in the public institutions owned by the federal government would benefit. So are you also open uh, or are you hoping that private universities, students, private universities uh, should benefit from this or you consider them elite and this should not cover them? I think uh, the purpose of this is access to education. And those in private university, they don't lack access to education. <laughs> So first, let's deal with these public schools first. Uh, if there is room to include private, if Nigeria government decide, of course, fine. But the purpose of it is to have access to education. You are going to private university, you have access to education. That's why you are in private school, you can afford the fees, and uh, uh, you don't have challenge. So the common masses who does not have access to quality education 
should be allowed first. That's why they didn't include the private schools. Because the fees in the private school, like what we said earlier, is high. They pay one point something million, eight hundred thousand, and the rest. But in the public, is not like that. So let's cover the public. That is the purpose for this uh, uh, student loan. All right, so let's talk about the 24th provision of that uh, law, uh, which has to do with uh, spread of this particular loan. We know government at different times have been accused of, <coughs> excuse me, accused of lopsidedness. I'm not talking about this government, different government. This government has also been accused of that. So what is NANS doing to ensure that this spread is as equitable as possible? And what do they mean by the spread? Is this by uh, geopolitical zone? So if we have maybe... A thousand people benefiting, we're going to distribute it equally across geopolitical zones, across state. What is spread, equitable spread? What does it mean in practical from the conversations you've had? Karata, that uh, if at all two million is to apply for it to be distributed equally to different zones, I think that's what no, no zone will be changed. Everybody will be carried along. I think there is a section in the law that recognizes that federal character, how things will be shared to every part of this country. I think that's what they are referring to in that aspect of it. Uh, I know that you, you, you are sort of ruling out or um, asking for uh, uh, a delay, so to speak, in the inclusion of the private sector in this scheme. But what about students in other state-owned universities? At that public hearing, was there any case for the inclusion, maybe in the short term rather than long term, of students in state universities such that they can also be part of uh, this scheme? In the, in the beginning, in the beginning, there was no exclusion from state universities. There wasn't at all. In the beginning, even right from the public hearings, state universities are included. So I don't know where that idea of say state universities are not, they are included. I think so. The only thing, the only thing there is that you know, in the federal institutions, there is no tuition fee, but states have tuition fee. I think that's just the the difference. But federal university, they have charges. They are developmental levies in the school that you pay. I think that's what they accumulate as school fees. But in the state university, they pay school fees. There is tuition fees. Yes, that's just different. But right from beginning, states and federal, it was captured in the news at so. So they were never in the beginning excluded at all. Uh, the practice has always been to also consider regions that are disadvantaged when it comes to education. So there's perhaps some more premium given to them uh, or some more expediency in some cases. Uh, even the entry requirements are reduced for them. I'm talking about regions in the north as well. Uh, was the case also made perhaps to have a little more for those in the north uh, compared to those perhaps in the south who have said time and again to have more access uh, to education? And that has been the case over time. Are we going to be seeing that with the student's loan as well? You know, in institutions, various institutions, they have different conditions for entrance. Like, for instance, the cutoff mark for JAM, some take 250, depending on the school. So in areas where there are low level of participation, that one is no one's fault. Those people, the leaders in those areas can encourage their citizens, their people to always come at the need for education. That one is not left for the nail fund to do. In areas where there are much numbers, for so for instance, south, south, uh, southwest, if there are 1,000 persons from there, and in the north, there are uh, 500, it is on the responsibility of the northern leaders to, to always encourage their citizens to participate, to take education very seriously and let them get involved so that they can benefit numbers from other zones. But I think there will be a general threshold that will be given to every zone, so I think so, in recognition of federal character, so that nobody will be left out, no zone will be left out, everybody will be fully involved, too. 
All right, so let's talk about some things. And if you look at the Act, uh, it's a sh very short document that anyone can go through. You see that certain things are left to the discretion of the board and the people in charge. That's the management. Uh, from your conversation, I, I use the word conversation a lot because you're a major stakeholder as a leader of the students' body in the country. So you win the know as a privileged person beyond what is carried on the news. Uh, how much is the maximum a student can access uh, for this particular loan? And um, let, let's start with that particular one first before I go to the next question. I think um, the board brings out policy. They've not come out with such figure. They've not come out with such figure. But I think the amount that student can access will be enough for the following. Tuition fee, hostel accommodation, and feeding. But I don't have a, a specific amount yet that a student can assess yet. I think even the day-to-day -day running, the board too can make, apart from what is, it's not stated in the act anyway, but the board can formulate that they know what every institution charge if someone is applying for school fees alone, they know what it can. There are some school fees that are up to 300 but I am very confident that it will not be more than 500000 per individual. That is just my own uh, personal views. I think so. Uh, but they have not come out with a specific amount to be taken. I think the board and the managing director will come out with that regulation so that it can be enough for everybody. Um, just to follow up on that, um, is there a cap on how often the loan can be uh, accessed, you know, considering the duration of um, school term or time for a student, for a law student, for instance, that would be five years, adding law school, medical students, seven years, and other courses, four years. So is there a cap on how often an applicant can access the loan? The, it's throughout your, your studies. The, those who have four years, after applying, you know, you pay these fees for a year. The next year you can apply. The other year you can apply until you graduate. I think that is, you can continuously apply after applying in year one. When you are in 200 level, you can apply. When you are in 300 level, you can apply. Even in your final year, you can apply. Even if your courses are five years too, until you graduate, because it's stated until you finish. You finish your NYC, you continuously to apply until you finish your, your studies. The, the, the reason why we're asking that question in particular, uh, you know, the, for the fact that you apply, it doesn't guarantee that you'll get it because the law is very clear that it's based on available funds. So are students ready for, you know, some of this disappointment that may happen for some of them? How much of awareness is being done by NANS to say application doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, the fact that you get it, and these are the reasons. Yes, we are doing our sensitization. The process is on. We are educating and sensitizing our students. The need, not only just the application and notes, the need to give correct and truthful information. Because if you give false information, you can be arrested and be tried for that. It is stated in the act as well. So, we are sure because we know that people who need this thing, because the desire to get it, to fulfill the condition, they will just give fake information. Uh, you can be liable for that. So it is our responsibility to continuously sensitize, tell them the disadvantage of giving false information, the consequences as well. So we keep, during the sensitization, we are telling students all of this, for them to be acquainted, to know the process and have best to apply for it too. Something we will need you to do very importantly as we wind down, and it's a review of this government regarding education in the past one year. If you are to rate this government, what would be your rating be based on the campaign promises? And I know that Nancy is apolitical, so this should be an objective rating. Uh, re from looking at the campaign promises, what was promised during campaigns, what was said uh, during the inauguration, how would you rate this government on a scale of zero to 100? Yes, I think uh, they have improved. 
as in that yeah, they have intense of education from this introduction of this student loan is highly commendable. We thank the government, the federal government for that. Then in infrastructure, I think uh, they have increased to from level of uh, 40 percent to about uh, uh, 70. The release of fund to third fund, I think third fund have come into intervene in terms of four steps in all our higher institutions. That is, they are building those steps now, the maintenance of their structures too. It has never happened in the history of this country, the kind of fund released to, for third fund now, about 600 and something billion. Before it used to be 300, 400. I think in infrastructure, the government is trying in that aspect. The introduction the of this overall. Are you current government overall pass excellent, fair, poor? What is that percentage? No, they are fair. They are fair. So I think they are fair. Percent I cannot say excellent. I can't say excellent, but they are fair. There is improvement from you. We are no longer where we are before. Where there is improvement, but not 100% uh, improvement. So it's a continuous process. So we want to commend them for that. Especially Tech Fund is doing excellently well in their intervention in our various institutions too. Then on the welfare of students, through building and renovation of our hostels. I think that is highly commendable too. We are happy with that. Thank you so much, Mr. Lucky, the president of National Association of Nigerian Students. Thank you for coming on the program for your insights. Yes. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. All right. So before we wind down, we've been following your thoughts and some of the things you've been saying. So let's take a few of them. Uh, okay, I'm trying to track. Yes, this is from uh, famous from London, England. He says, the student loan should be amended and passed into law as grants. And this one also is from another writer. And uh, they say, I agree with the NANS president that private universities should be considered much later after the children of the common man are being attended to. Well, I see Atinoke uh, underscore TK on X also speaking about the same. Government shall invest in free primary and secondary education and provide means tested and academic scholarships through the tertiary institutions themselves. So we see all of your messages. But uh, we need to touch on this very important one, and it concerns the retired Nigerian police officers' protest at the National Assembly over unpaid pensions. We need to ring this in yet again. And this user, uh, follow underscore ATL, says, it's so sad to see our retired heroes protesting for their rightful pensions. It's unacceptable that they're not being taken care of after dedicating their lives to serving uh, the nation. And you see, oh, this person thinks that's why it's been tough to attract top talent to the police. Absolutely. So, well, uh, maybe we'll take one more. Allah, Alagba Kenneth uh, saying, what are they doing with the pension funds if those who serve Nigeria can lament over unpaid pensions? Hurry up and pay to boost the morales of those still in service. It's a miracle to retire alive, but not in tears. So, uh, those are the ones we can take uh, on the program. So, thank you so much for your time and, of course, your usual company. Uh, we are going to have Julius the Genius Ago in another day, another day on the program. Couldn't make it to the program today, so we're going to have him on another day on the program, of course. So he's one of the OGs of comedy. Thank you for watching. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Yeah, all of those assessments are, you know, definitely something to reflect on. And thank you for being part of it. We'll return yet again tomorrow with another bumper edition. I am Bukola Koka. So take this as our heads up. There's been heavy traffic in Lagos as a result of the rains. That's why we're going to have Julia Sago. So plan your trip appropriately. Don't forget to hold your umbrellas so you don't get wet. Sunrise Daily is next, of course. I'm Kairi Okikilu. Goodbye.